Welcome back to the Foreign Desk. I'm Lisa Daftari. Escalations in the region. I mean, we'll talk about uh, the mullahs really, really, really pulling a fast one on the rest of the world with all of their proxies now involved in escalations, in targeting the U.S., in targeting Israel from Syria and Iraq and Yemen and uh, Lebanon, and the list goes on and on. And when we have this craziness in the world, we call upon our favorite expert, Dr. Waleed Ferris, good friend and partner in crime, internationally recognized analyst and the author who is called upon by the majority of news outlets today and always to shed light on what's going on. He's also the co-secretary of Transatlantic Parliamentary Group and former foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump, author of several books you should know about, but mainly his latest book, which is on my desk always, and I have referred to it many times in my programs, uh, which is called Iran, an Imperialist Republic and U.S. Policy, which looks at exactly how we got to where we got well, why we're dealing with all of this craziness in the region and uh, how to deter Iran's regime at this point moving forward. Welcome to the program again, Walid. Thank you, Lisa, so much. I'm always, always very happy that we could have a conversation uh, leading to a better education and information of your own audience, which is already a very special audience to me. And thanks to you, you are spreading that uh, public education at a time where our universities, our colleges are in crisis, especially in Middle Absolutely. Eastern studies and foreign policy. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up the universities. I think um, we we do what we do be because of that. I remember being a Middle Eastern studies major in undergrad and already seeing this issue then. Um, obviously, it's gotten much worse. And I want you to help us break it down because I think even for the audience that is engaged, that is involved, that does follow the news, the news isn't providing the, the proper contextualization, um, taking into uh, consideration the history, uh, the, the economic um, connection to all of this, uh, looking at these various proxies in the region and understanding what Iran's regime's agenda is in all of this. And that's what I want to start with. Obviously, okay. we're watching what's unfolding with the IDF's war inside Gaza and trying to eradicate Hamas, trying to get the hostages back. The world understands something very different, but we will talk about the facts on this program. We're watching that unfold, obviously, and, and, and we're past 100 days on that war. S side by side, even though the White House is trying to disconnect these two, we're watching Iran unleash its other proxies uh, to target U.S. assets in the region. So we're seeing Syria and Iraq and the Houthis in Yemen. And of, of course, Hezbollah has been a constant in all of this. Um, as you know, I, I heard John Spencer say uh, to me in a, in, a, in a different interview, if we only had Hezbollah's provocations right now, that would already warrant a, a separate war if we weren't already involved in the, in the current war against Hamas. So a lot going on right now. Let's start to unpack it. Why is this all happening right now in terms of its timing? Why, when did Iran's regime wake up and this is a good time to unleash my various proxies, which I have been building up for many years. Uh, Lisa, this is the core question. If I was still giving seminars at the various national security agencies, and I was, National Defense University and the other agencies, I would say this question is worth addressing by the highest echelons of our defense and intelligence uh, elites and analysts. Why? Because we are not dealing with multiple separate wars, one in Gaza, and you just mentioned them. Uh, of course, the Houthis, it's like hundreds of miles south and on the uh, Bab el Mandeb area. And then you go north, you have Hezbollah, which is a, a whole new different battlefield, which was tested in 2006. Then you travel to Syria. That's, that's a whole different country. Mm -hmm. And the Israelis yeah. are involved in striking. And we know now a few hours ago or last, uh, last night, uh, a number of senior officials of the Pazdaran, Iran and the Rus Guard were, were hit by the uh, Israelis. And of course, Iraq, where the militias are attacking our troops, that's even another type of war, another type of foe, but also engaged in preparing for a strike against, uh, against Israel. And on top of that, you have in the center this Israeli involvement in countering Hamas. This is not Israeli invasion of Gaza. Israelis didn't want to invade any Gaza, any part of Gaza. They couldn't believe when they exited in 2005, we still have the, uh, 
the media of the time, Israelis were saying, finally, we're out of there. Let the Arab world, let the Arab League, let the Palestinian Authority deal with it. So we are addressing multiple battles. Mm -hmm. It could be wars in a mother of, I mean, in a machine, a master machine that starts in Iran. And you and I have discussed it many times. To answer your question quickly, the Iran regime has the timing in their own hands. Before October 7, there was no Gaza war. They decided. They decided. And the reasons, if you want, I could go over them quickly and then we could take one after the other. First reason is to destroy the Saudi Israeli rapprochement. We could delve into this. Second reason is basically to attack our troops in Syria and Iraq using this war. Third reason, and that's very close to your heart and your community, is to crush the Iran revolution. What better would be to have a war overseas or a war far away right. and then to crush it? And there is another one that I have not spoken about on your show, which is expanding the Iran regime influence and propaganda in the West. Absolutely. I mean, um, we and we should go after each one of these because I think what you and I actually, we don't frame it as the psychology of all of this, but that's exactly what it is. The Iran regime, obviously, in the case of Israel, knows that the world, world opinion will always be against Israel. So that's, that's a fair assessment. <laughs> yeah. What is the Iran regime assuming about the United States Biden foreign policy that it thought that right now is the right time to unleash all of this? That's another fabulous question. And I deal with it. Unfortunately, the Western media, American media, doesn't go deeper in the analysis. You and I were are on media all the time. But the Arab media, especially the Arab coalition media, Gulf media, they, they see eye to eye with, with this analysis that you and I share. And here's, here's the most dangerous point. I will start with the worst, and then we'll, we'll make our way back to the less important. It looks like the Iran regime, I don't want to say it's coordinating but is getting whispers from their friends at the higher spheres of analysis of all the communities, defense, intelligence, and the administration. Remember, we had a scandal a few months ago, you and I discussed it, about uh, senior analysts with all the security clearances that you could imagine, who are coordinating and speaking with senior officials of the Iran regime, that alone. That alone spies, should... say spies. Yeah, you say spies, and I'm, I'm behind my legal uh, protection at this point in time, but not for too long. It's worse than spies. They are coordinating. A spy will come and spy, get information, send it. That's minor. But one who actually is briefing our national security right. levels all the way and coordinating with the Iranians, this is why if you are in Tehran and a big boss, a big mullah or Pasdaran, fine, America is not going to retaliate, so let's Press on. And the worst is that our spokesperson in the administration, I'm being very blunt here, they almost confirm it. They say, we're not at war with the Houthis. Are you serious? <laughs> you're saying you're not at war. You are delivering to them this, what, what they are getting already from inside Washington. That's, that's why Iran's regime is on steroids at this point in time. Right, because they have formal infiltration, not even informal, as you said. <laughs> and um, deep one. I, and deep, exactly right, with access in the highest you know, levels of clearance and, and things that, that you and I wouldn't be able to get at this point in this administration, for sure. <laughs> um, let's, let's break down this, this narrative, because I think it's very important for Americans. I think um, you and I have worked in American media, and I remember um, our former boss, Roger Ailes, when he first met me, he said, you have a a, a, you know, an obsession with foreign policy and, and national security, and that's not what the American audience cares about. So you have yeah. to figure out how to feed them the broccoli. And it's so interesting because this always stayed with me, how to present very, what, what to us is very important for the American audience, because now more than ever, it's very important for the American audience, whether it's in terms of national security on our southern border or looking at our assets or looking at how the United States has diminished on the global stage. It affects all of us, whether it's what we're paying at the gas, at the gas station, what we're doing in terms of our groceries, everything, the economy, everything is connected. And that's what I want us to do is to connect those dots. Starting with, we're going into an election year, mm. obviously. No administration, left, right, center, no administration wants to get involved in a war, particularly in an election year. 
But when you have the spokesperson from this White House, as you said, when you have everyone else from Secretary of State Lincoln to John Kirby to President Biden himself, almost denying what is happening in terms of the, these Houthi attacks, in terms of, of the United States' positioning, and then as a part two, micromanaging Israel's war in the Middle East mm. instead of just giving them um, much more freedom to do what they need to do, tying their hands and, and constraining them in some respect. How will this affect us going for, forward? Meaning, it seems as though this administration is looking at it from a very narrow scope because we are in an election year, because they want this to go away, because they don't want to get involved in another war and, and all you know, um, just, just causes. But what message is the Iran regime getting when they deny, when they try to de-escalate in a way? Can we deter them at this point? And what does this rhetoric do to further damage and further endanger the United States? Well, that's a PhD dissertation that we need to get out as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, the, that's the why short... you're here, because I know you could do it in two minutes. <laughs> but you too, we are equal in this, you too. So the bottom line is this. In my book, I made the case that the Iran deal by itself is a transaction. It's releasing money to the Iran regime. That's the bottom line of it, right? Because the Iran regime has promised many things that have not been done. And actually, we didn't even hold them to any promise. We didn't even ask them to do the right thing. If I, if I was the negotiator, if I was even negotiating the Iran deal, first thing I would do, the first one is disconnect with the militias. Let your colonies go like in Iraq, in Syria, Hezbollah, in Lebanon, Hamas, and that would be my first thing. And then I will discuss the armament, uh, the arming of Iran regime, so on and so forth. Having said that, I will say it's a transaction. And when you have a transaction, it's unseen by the public. That's why consistently I asked members of Congress and I continue to do so now with the, with the, with the new speaker, let us know what's in this Iran deal. Let us know this money that is going, these are billions of dollars. I mean, we go after smugglers right and left. We don't know what, the, what the, the Iran regime is doing with them. It creates influence here, Elisa. That's the real problem that the American public need to understand. Is this relentless by this administration and the Obama administration? But this one is even doing more, though the Obama administration was the one that launched the, uh, the agreement. This administration is breaking its own policy. They are communicating to the other side that we're not going to go after you. The deal is more important, which gives room for maneuver to Tehran and their leaders and Hezbollah. They, they are like relaxed. They look at whatever we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like sitting in a cell right. and that nothing is going to happen. And they know that this is going to be for the rest of the year, of this year. So to answer your question the best I can, nothing is going to change in Washington's policy for the whole year. And until next year, when possibly a different administration with a different foreign policy, if it's the same, I, I don't meddle in elections, as you know, if it's the same, we're going to get worse situation in foreign policy or the same policy, unless there is a catastrophe that occurs. If Iran does or the Islamic Republic of Iran does something outside that transaction, force Washington to, to, to react. But time is rushing. I don't know, even if the Biden administration decides today. Right? They read my book, they, they listen to you, and they change, which is not God willing, yeah. They don't have the time. What is it that they can do now if they don't do a strategic move? That's why I'm concerned that we're going to be living Do another... they have the credibility? Forget about the time. Do they have the credibility? Even if for another four years, which is more dangerous, it will give them five years. Let's say five years of this. Do they have the credibility in Tehran to now all of a sudden be firm with Iran's regime? The United States administration doesn't have any credibility so far in this year. Let me talk about what we what is our, under our vision. If they if they change on Monday, it's going to take them more than next year to have effects. So imagine you're going to have to fight with the militias in Iraq and Syria. That alone is huge. You're going to lead a campaign in Yemen after four years of you know of five, six, seven years of not allowing a dismantling of of the Houthis. Remember. Even during the Trump years, the media here, you're very familiar with this media, Washington Post, New York Times, and then the opposition in Congress were pounding the Saudis and the Emiratis for trying to drive out the Houthis. And then now in this administration, 
we take the Houthis out of the list, the uh, terror mm-hmm. list, and then we, we are pressuring uh, Riyadh and others to stop, and then we put pressure on Israel. On top of it, we put pressure on Israel not to retaliate against Iran. We are maybe 50 points below zero. The best that could happen is we could get to zero by December if this administration changes direction. So much to, to ask you. Okay. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> you know, you said something interesting. If they change their ways, being in Washington and having the access that you have, do you think that there is something inside this regime, because uh, this administration rather, that believes that they can still get a deal with Iran's regime by the end of their term? A. Hmm. B, last week we heard President Biden, it was a soundbite that I think you and I both um, reacted to on, on a news program together, that President Biden says, Iran got, I gave Iran the message, something along those lines. What is he talking about? What message did he deliver? And do you think that if you move away all this clutter and all the flexing of the Houthis and the flexing of Iran's regime and not letting the IAEA inspectors in and all of that, do you think that there is backtalk between our administration and Iran to get a deal before their term ends? In my modest experience, and you followed that experience, and you and I discussed it many, many times, I was, okay, foreign policy advisor to two presidential campaigns. You basically deal with the administration, especially in the last months. You have to, there is a mechanism uh, that would be initiated by the bureaucracy. So I know a little bit about how it works on the inside, obviously advising members of Congress for 12 years. So he, here's the deal. First question I have, and I never go you know, on the personal level and the personalities of leaders. I don't. But I am not sure if this president, our president now, is getting the right assessment from the circle around him because the way he expresses himself, right, the way he expresses himself is very different from Obama. It's very different from you know, even, even, even George Bush. So I would say that, I would, sorry, this is interference. I would say that the first problem is to make sure that the advisors are able to get to the president with all the ideas they have. Second, the negotiator, there are two groups in this administration. The negotiators on the one hand, they assure the president that the Iranian regime is basically able and willing to continue with the, um, with the negotiations and get to a deal. So that he has that one sound. Then obviously the Pentagon, uh, our agencies, the intelligence agencies, are actually reporting to him and to his advisors that that's not what Iran is doing. So he's getting the two sounds uh, from his own administration, and the difficulty is to manage what is the decision about it, what to do about it. That's why we see that zigzag in the decisions. It's, it's interesting because um, in a time where we have more tools for transparency than ever before, we have less transparency than we've ever seen. Um, especially when you're saying there are, you know, um, elements within the White House that not only are not transparent towards the president, but have their own agenda that goes against U.S. interests, which is just mind boggling. And probably we hold, we need a whole other episode to dedicate to that. What I want to get to now is what we, what we set out to talk about today, and that is how to deter the Houthis and how to get out of this or how to deescalate what seems to be escalating on a daily basis. And that is the Iran regime's desire to provoke or or draw the United States into a much bigger conflict um, to connect this potentially the little Satan and the big Satan. That's what they set out to do from from day one to attack them both. Um, And to really uh, ridicule the United States on the global stage, which the United States is is, is a great partner for that. Um, I said on the show, you know, there's deterrence doesn't start on the military field. It starts at the at the White House, and that this this White House has, has lost that opportunity. And the next day, I saw that you tweeted, you know, these are the steps that you can take to deter um, the Houthis at this point. So I thought, who better than to out to outline this strategy for us? We wish you were in the White House, but you're not. So the best thing we could do is have you here. Um, what or how do you believe that the current situation? can be de-escalated to not draw the United States into something much larger? If the question is about what is the strategy not to draw us into action, there isn't because the initiative is in the hands of the Iran regime and of the Houthi militias. They control if we go in or if we don't. 
I would even go to the point of they are assured or they believe that the, the United States will go to a certain point, meaning that the Iran regime is controlling the Houthi firepower from Tehran and telling them you go to that point, you paralyze, you get the insurance high, and of course, US Navy and other assets are going to respond to you, but they're not going to destroy you. That's the only equation I can see at this point in time. If there is a change in Washington at the level of the administration, our Pentagon and our assets could take out the entire Houthi uh, missile force and drone force. I mean, we, we took uh, Iran, uh, Iraq's regime in 32 days. That's a million soldier army with all the stuff that existed at the time in 1991. I know we can do the same with the Houthis, but there is a decision in Washington to try to resolve it while negotiating the uh, Iran deal. And the Iran regime knows that. So that's why they are you know, they're doing front burner, back burner in violence, and they, they hope to harvest this and maybe more billions to be paid to Tehran with the next uh, few months. It doesn't look like the administration wants to fully, fully uh, deter Iran's regime, particularly with regards to the Houthis, because we saw this past week they were redesignated as a terror organization, but yet that's not a full designation meaning they don't want to fully punish or, or, or fully uh, bring about the same punitive damages against Iran's regime. So it looks like there's still, there, there is still a weariness in Washington with regards to uh, going after Iran's assets in, in, the, in the region. And that just seems mind boggling. Um, the, uh, in, in the meantime, uh, as as they continue to pull different triggers, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq or Yemen, uh, in the meantime, this is causing a lot of, of global economic um, damage. We're seeing a, a 40% uh, decrease in, in just activity in that part of the world with ships trying to stay out of this, trying to not be fired at, right? right? Um, but at this point, Walid, we're looking at a drastic drop in the traffic uh, around the Red Sea, we're looking at carriers and different private and um, companies that will not go through that area, obviously wanting to uh, steer clear of, of any uh, getting involved in any um, fire. Um, what can the United States do to de-escalate in some capacity that would be meaningful around the, the Red Sea and to give the Houthis and Iran's regime some sort of real message, not the message that President Biden is referring to? It is, Lisa, a change of strategy and direction. This current policy is not going to work to do some additional, you know, uh, co cosmetic changes. It needs a change. And it means that the Biden administration will have now to stop the negotiations with the Iranians until uh, policies change in the Islamic Republic towards the region as a whole. But practically, let's suppose if a miracle happens and the White House, Pentagon, agencies, State Department, they want to have the visor strategy. It will have to be multi-front, multi-fronts as well. Number one, responding, not just responding to the launchers that are being used by the Houthis against the ships. That's a phony war. That's like the droll de guerre during World War II between the French and the Germans before the Germans attacked. Number two, take out the anti-aircraft, anti-missile and missile system. You know, we did, we did Iraq in 32 days and Iraq had an army of 1 million. Uh, the Houthis are not that powerful, but it's a political, political decision not to do it. But more important, the Iranians are getting, the Iran regime are getting logistics, not just from water and, and you know, and air. So we need to do a, a complete a seizing of uh, having Iranian ships and vessels or allies going into uh, Hodeida, the port of the, of the Houthis. We need to make sure that Iranian planes are not landing. So you are cutting off a large segment of the logistics. We also noted that there is a no, another land route that comes through Oman, and part of that land route goes through Yemen. And who controls that land route? Muslim Brotherhood militia. So it is much more complex and deeper than one would think. So we need to take care of that. And last point, I made a, a suggestion even to members of Congress. We need to have allies on the ground. In Iraq and in Syria, who do we fight along with? With the Kurds. Now, it happened that South Yemen was a republic in the past, are secular, are moderate, uh, their, their women are free, and their, their policy is, you know, two things regarding this matter. Number one, they want to fight the Houthis, not to fight them, but to contain them. 
and then they want to sign an Abraham Accord agreement. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. what we have on the ground, this huge force in South Yemen that we have isolated, that we have neglected over the past three years. So this combo together, if used, will deter the Houthis for sure. That actually was my last question for you in the sense of looking at the region from where you sit. What has happened to that sentiment of a, the Arab Spring, right, having partners in, in rising up and wanting a better future. And of course, the Abraham Accords, which really put that on steroids and said, ah, oh, you've, you've now come to your senses. Let's take this one step forward into a, an interest aligned treaty that really um, uh, benefits the, the entire region as a whole. When this Gaza war is over, how do you see the Saudis coming back to uh, normalize relations with Israel? Do you see other partners stepping up or do you see a, a, this whole movement forward taking a pause? Lisa, you know, I know the region very well and you do it as well. People, some of our media here, which are supportive of the Iran deal, it's a very sophisticated approach, are painting the region, oh, because of the Gaza war and because Israel is inside Gaza, 80% uh, of the Arab street it has shifted, not at all. Now we have social media, we read what we read what they're saying. Now I begin with Instagram to Twitter to you know even all the other means. And if you go and visit uh, Amman and then Cairo, and then most importantly what's happening in Saudi Arabia, obviously to the Emirates, the basis, the popular basis of the region, the middle class, the non-vocal ones and the youth, they don't want to do anything with the jihadists. I mean, you have so many friends in the region and you know that. So we're gonna bank on those. We're gonna actually work for the re, uh, formation of the uh, Arab coalition. And of course, to give a lot of strength to the Abraham Accord, to answer a question, of course, Saudi Arabia will be back. Of course, there's no doubt about that. And whatever is gonna happen in Iraq and in Syria, there are new forces within these civil societies. They are telling us in the open right. on social media that they will subscribe to the agreement after that That's war. So I think so too. It, we talk about the irony of young Americans admiring Osama bin Laden and supporting Hamas, where you look at, at young Iranians, Lebanese, yes. Yemeni, Iraqis, understanding the threat of global terror, understanding they want it out of their country, and laughing at these American academics, the students, the protesters. Um, it's a crazy day in America, but thank God to uh, people like yourself. No one can break it down like you do. Thank you for coming back with us. You're always welcome at the Foreign Desk. And I encourage you all to pick up his book. If you want to truly understand how to connect the dots on the region, pick up this book. I will link it below. And uh, I, I encourage you to all follow Dr. Ferris and to uh, listen to his advice. He's always right and always a few steps ahead of everyone else, especially those sitting in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Waleed. For those of you at home who would like to subscribe to our weekly podcast, go to YouTube.com or wherever else you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to subscribe to our daily email, go to ForeignDeskNews.com and you can subscribe there. Thank you all and see you all next time.